Hey everyone, welcome to this week's uh, reading with myself and PD Mac. We are beginning book three, uh, Empire of Serpents, and this is the final book in the series. And so we're going to do the same thing, just a video a week with two chapters. So we will jump right into it. <clears throat> Chapter one, Gwen. The city of Haddens was a flurry of activity. When watched, merchants pitched their wares from brightly colored silks to food that permeated the air with their scents. Small children ran along the streets, playing a game and shouting at each other lighthearted. It was almost enough to make her think that the impending darkness of Torian's madness was just a dream. Almost. Vinya had landed outside the city, and Gwen had walked from there. Despite traveling by air, which had been a living nightmare for Gwen, it had still taken two days to reach the city. Vinya had a voracious appetite and continuously stopped to eat. She promised to be at the rebellion meeting, but Gwen wasn't sure how that would happen. Vinya was massive, so unless the rebellion was meeting outside in a large open field, it didn't seem possible. The more pressing issue was that Gwen didn't know where the meeting location was, and it wasn't likely she could ask someone. Could she? Good day, madam. Wear the finest clothing this side of the border, a merchant said to her, producing an armful of elegantly sewn dresses. I sew them myself. The merchant offered a grin that stretched his pockmarked face and revealed a mouthful of yellow teeth. He was bald and slightly overweight, but his clothing was of high quality. Gwen smiled pol and politely shook her head. No, thank you. You haven't seen a group of people that seem out of place, have you? I'm afraid not, the merchant replied, offering a wink. He tapped his waist where a bag hung from his belt. It clinked with coins. The man's intent was obvious, and Gwen retrieved a coin from her purse and offered it to the merchant. He swept his hand over hers, and the coin vanished, but Gwen hadn't felt his touch at all. Was he truly a merchant or some sort of vagrant pickpocket? Go to the end of the street, and you'll see the butcher shop on the right. Beside it, there's an alley that'll take you to a door. Knock twice. Thank you, Gwen said. She continued along the cobblestone street, but she, but she could feel eyes watching her. A glance over her shoulder revealed the bald man was gone, replaced by an elderly woman. Gwen thought it was odd, but she followed the man's directions anyway. At the end of the street was the butcher's building, and Gwen found the alley. She stepped into the darkened space and walked 20 feet to reach the door. Gwen raised her hand to knock and heard shuffling behind her. Don't move, someone said gruffly. Gwen froze. Her heart skipped a beat. Who are you, and what do you want? I'm here to see my friends, Gwen replied vaguely. Names, girl. Gwen considered lying, but decided not to. If this person was connected to the rebellion and she used a fake name, it could get her, could keep her from getting into the meeting. His name is Eridor. Never heard of him, the gruff man replied. Perhaps I'm in the wrong place. I'm sorry, I'll just be on my way. You aren't going anywhere. Something sharp jabbed into Gwen's lower back and she sucked in a breath. Please shut your mouth, the man said. He applied pressure on the blade and Gwen flinched. Who sent you here? Torian? Grimar? I'll gut you like a fish, you blasted spy. Gwen barely heard the words. She was focused on the pulse of magic flowing through the fire room. Her right hand grew warm as the flames started to form. The door in front of her opened and a robed figure stepped into view. What's this? A spy. I was just about to show her what we do to spies. Gwen? At the sound of her name, Gwen cut off the magic and looked up to see Eridor. The elf was a welcome sight and she rushed forward and wrapped him in a tight hug. Eridor's surprise quickly faded, and he patted her on the back, then pushed her at arm's length. Is everything all right? What are you doing here? He looked down the alley, then back at her. Where's Amel? It's a long story, Gwen said. Amel's a traitor. Come in, Eridor bade. Tell me everything. As for you, Eridor turned his eyes on the guard. You almost got burned to a crisp and didn't even know it. Next time, check for runes. Yes, sir, came the gruff reply. Gwen turned to look at the man and saw it was the merchant who'd given her directions. He tucked his dagger away and offered a bow to her. My apologies, just doing my duty. Don't worry about it, Gwen replied. She stepped inside the building, and Eridor closed, the, and, closed and latched the door. Speak as we walk. The leaders of the rebellion are about to convene. Gwen related the events at Olivelle and Steepcross, leaving out nothing. She even showed Eridor her eyes, the dark rune lines that started at her collarbone. His expression was unreadable, but Gwen had the feeling that he wasn't happy about the dark magic. The two reached a small room guarded by a handful of warriors and a mage. 
When she finished talking, Eridor was silent for a long while. Where's the vial? He finally asked. Marjorie destroyed it. She said it was too dangerous to give it back to me. Eridor frowned. If what you say is true, Emil poses a great threat. She's been privy to many things within the rebellion. She also knows about me, Gwen said. What do you mean? She was in the room when Marjorie told me my true name. Emil knows I'm Cameron's daughter. I doubt she'll keep that information to herself. I think you're right. She's probably already reported to Torian. I wouldn't be surprised if Grimar himself comes looking for you. Come with me. The others need to know. The guards stepped aside to let them, to allow them through. There were many people Gwen didn't recognize. A few familiar faces stood out, and she was relieved when she spotted Lyra. Roland was also present. He'd been there when Tobias had fallen during the fight at the outpost. Seeing him brought back a rush of memories. Emil had been there too. The feeling of betrayal stung Gwen's heart again, and she forced herself to swallow her anger. Emil would pay dearly. We've come together to devise our plans against Torian, er Eridor said, raising his voice to be heard over the scattered conversations. The noise died down and Eridor motioned to Gwen. These plans will be greatly affected by the news that we have a queen to lead us. This is Quinn Lee, the daughter of King Cameron. All eyes went to Gwen. She wasn't used to being the center of attention and she could feel her face flushing. Hold on, it was a dwarf. Gwen looked at him, glad for the distraction. It diverted everyone's attention from her. The dwarf had thick curly brown hair and a long beard. He folded his arms across his chest and glared at Eridor. We don't need a queen to lead us when we've got a king. He thumbed toward a man behind him. Gwen was drawn to the man for reasons she couldn't understand. He was handsome and fit, with thick auburn hair and intense brown eyes. Who are you? Eridor asked. Name's Torgriff, and his name is Connell. He's the son of King Cameron and the heir to the throne. What proof do you have? Eridor asked. We have proof from the Great Library that this is Quinn Lee. And we have proof of the naming rooms, Drewson spoke up that this is Darby, Cameron's only son. The others in the room began trying to talk over one another until it was a mass shouting match. Gwen rubbed her temples. All the noise was going to give her a headache. Stop, she shouted. Everyone just stop. The room went silent and Gwen sighed in relief. I don't want to lead us to war against Torian. I'm not a warrior and I know nothing of battle. I will defer to Connell. And if Connell is Cameron's son, that means he's my brother. There is no need for division among family. Gwen looked at Connell and waited to see what he would say. She hoped he would agree to take the lead. If she were forced into it, she was afraid many people would die due to, due to the mistakes that she would make. Connell gazed at his sister. She was very pretty. Part of him wondered, had they met in different circumstances as strangers, whether anything would have happened between them. He shuddered at the thought and refocused. Yet here she was, both a stranger and a sister. He thought he should feel something, some sort of elation at the reuniting the family. But his family had been murdered, and what he felt now had nothing to do with family. I accept battle leadership, Connell said, calmly. Though his words were full of confidence, his expression hinted that he had some doubts. Thank you, brother. Gwen felt weird saying that. She'd been an only child her entire life. Yet now her long-lost brother was here, in the same room with her. It was difficult for her to fathom. What's the plan? Eridor looked at Connell. Torian has many prestiges at his command. But the great library's emissary has informed us that they will join our forces. With their prestige is on our side, we might just stand a chance against Torian. We also have a dragon on our side, Gwen said. A dragon? Eridor asked. You didn't mention a dragon. Sorry, I wasn't sure how I should bring it up, but the dragon that brought me here promised her aid. Her name is Venya. We also have a dragon, Connell said. We had two, but one was killed by dragon hunters. Do these dragons know each other? Eridor asked. I'll have to ask her, Gwen replied. She said she would be here for the meeting, but obviously she isn't here. Don't be so sure, Lyra spoke up. Dragons can do many things, and that includes shape-shifting. Gwen looked at Lyra curiously. It's true, Connell agreed. I've seen it myself. Are you Venya? Gwen was su being surprised at every, every, at every turn. I am, Lyra, really Venya, answered, though you should use my elven name. My dragon name is personal and only given to those I trust. Gwen remembered asking the dragon for her name in Olivelle, and Venya had given it to her. She was humbled by the trust that such a mighty creature had in her and felt indebted somehow. With dragons on our side, we should easily be able to take Eisenthal back, Eridor said. Don't place too much hope in dragons, Connell canceled. Yes, they are powerful, but very few remain, less than a dozen, and Torian has dragon hunters tracking them down. We've killed those hunters we found, but there's no telling how many more are on the prowl. 
then it's probably a good idea to keep them split up in case these hunters make it into our camp somehow. Do you have a plan? Connell slowly nodded. We need to keep Torian off balance. It seems to me that Gwen has the weight of magic on her side. I know nothing about magic. Therefore, I propose we divide our efforts. Gwen and her forces attack from the east with all the magic we can employ to force Torian to concentrate his efforts and attention to the east. My forces will wait until Torian is occupied with battling in the east, then we will attack from the west. I'll take Gwen to Oliville to meet up with Kirith and his forces, Lyra said. They're ready to march with us. He just needs to receive word before we arrive. That's easily done through magical means, Eridor said. I'll have a message sent to Kirith. That begs the question of how do we coordinate our efforts once we are in position, Connell asked. We can't afford to wait for a messenger to get to us days after the fact. I have an answer for that as well, Eridor smiled. We have two mages that are connected magically by runes, but their bond is deeper than that. They're twins. Their sibling connection seems to have strengthened the power of the runes, and they can communicate with one another over long distances, longer distances than usual. One of them will travel with Gwen, and the other will travel with you. Connell smiled. Amazing things, these runes. That will work. What about the cities and towns along the way? Gwen asked. The people there are innocent and shouldn't suffer because we're marching through. I've thought about that, Connell said. Anyone willing to join us is more than welcome. We could use all the extra bodies we can get. Everyone else stay put and stay safe. Everyone else can stay put and stay safe and out of the way. Most importantly, we buy everything we need along the way. Food, supplies, even the ale. We are reclaiming a kingdom, not punishing it. We want this to be as painless as possible. Gwen was beginning to like Connell even more. He seemed to be a man of good intentions, and she believed he would be a great leader in the aftermath of Torian's defeat. We can work out the minor details along the way, Connell added. I think we should get moving. The quicker we are in position, the less time Torian has to prepare. Gwen could feel excitement stirring within her. She wasn't a warrior, but she was ready to do what her people needed of her. Chapter 2, Connell. Ignoring the usual after-meeting conversations, Connell focused on Gwen. Crossing over to stand before her, the difference in height became glaring. He towered over her by at least two hand spans, causing him to wonder how one set of parents could produce two children of such different sizes. Yet, she was very pretty, her green eyes inquisitive as she returned his stare. So, you're my sister. It would seem so. Where have you been? I grew up in Dawsbury, right under Torian's nose. It's on the edge of Isentol. And what did you do? My father owned it in. She caught herself, remembering the man she had called her father. A lump formed in her throat, but she didn't cry. The tears didn't come as often as they did before. I served tables for him. An inn, Cuddle chuckled, slowly nodding. An interesting place to raise a king's daughter. Gwen smiled in return. What about you? Where did you grow up? Irve, a coastal town in Tirmanach. My father was a jewelry merchant. Was? Connell's casual demeanor vanished. He's dead. My entire family is dead. Torian had them killed. Torian's men killed my father and my friend. His name is Tobias, she replied. Herodor walked up, a man and woman tagging along. I know you two have a lot to talk about, but unfortunately we're running out of time. These are the mage twins I mentioned, Kaelin and Corla. Connell suppressed a grin for the twins couldn't be more different. Kaelin was a handsome and taller with dirty blonde hair and brown eyes. He wasn't handsome as far as eye catching, but he wasn't unattractive either. And there was something about him that immediately put Connell off. The man exuded a not so subtle arrogance. His twin, on the other hand, was a very attractive buxom strawberry blonde with an hourglass figure, a little taller than Gwen. In contrast to Kaylin's smugness, Carla looked a bit like she felt out of place, her emerald green eyes darting around the room, taking everything in. Connell silently prayed that Corla was his twin. One of them will, Herodor, before Kaylin cut him off, I'll go with her. He thrust a finger at Gwen, then nudged Corla towards Connell. You can have my sister. That's fine, Con replied a little too quickly, hoping Gwen and Eridor thought he was covering Kaelin's crass behavior. You'd better get moving then, 
Herodor said, giving the oblivious Kalin a look of irritation. Connell turned to Gwen. See you at Havengard. Take care of yourself. You too. Her eyes locked onto his and she smiled at him. For an awkward moment, Connell felt he should do something demonstrable, like a hug or something, to show he recognized he had a family again. But it would be like hugging a distant cousin he had met once growing up. He's about to give in and give her the noncommittal hand wave when she closed the gap between them and hesitantly hugged him. Watch yourself, she cautioned. Our uncle knows we're alive. She didn't, didn't have to say anything else, for Connell understood. Let me know where you're in, when you're in position. I will, she answered, releasing him. She felt like there was more to say, but whatever it was, the words eluded her. See you soon. You too, Connell replied, ready to move on. All the questions you wanted to ask would have, would have to wait. He turned to Corla. You ready? Yes, she shyly replied. He searched the room and found Torbreth and Galadir in conversation with Voldar and Lorcan. The elf with a bemused smile as he listened to Voldar relate some tale. Connor caught Torbreth's attention and soon the group was out in the streets and headed to the city gates. Where's Drewston? Connell asked, suddenly remembered the half druid dragon. As I saw him, Galadir answered, he was talking to Lyra. Lyra, Connell remembered, Drust remembered Drewston's words. Two of our females have reached that age. It won't be long for the other four. He wondered if Lyra was one of the female dragons who could still bear young. Speaking of which, Torbeth said, casting a sly look at Connell. What's this? We had two dragons, but one was killed. Stuff. I've been with you for who knows how long, and I, I've never even seen one dragon, let alone two if they even exist. They exist, my friend, Galadir replied. Torbeth frowned at the elf. You've seen one? Yes. A dragon? Voldar interrupted, cocking eyebrow in disbelief. You've actually seen a dragon. Simply saying, I'm a dragon, doesn't mean you are one. If he says he has, then he has, Torbeth retorted. Okay, okay, Voldar shot back. What's with you? He's an elf, and elves don't lie. And even if they did, I still trust him. Thank you, Torgreth, Gallagher said, dipping in his head in appreciation. I pray that I always have your trust. Yeah, yeah, Voldar responded with a little twinge of jealousy. What about the dragons? How about we have this conversation in private once we're outside the city, Connell interjected. He's right, Corlew said, her voice soft and delicate. There are too many prying ears here. Connell noted that she walked behind him, doing her best to keep up. Slowing the pace, he mo motioned for her to walk beside him. So you and your brother can communicate even through those separated by great distances. It was a statement rather than a question. Yes, she gazed up at him, smiling pleasantly. It's a trait we discovered when we were very young. Connell returned the gaze and smiled as they walked. Are you really twins? She giggled with the girlish charm. Yes. Who is the oldest? I am. Were your parents surprised that they were having twins? No. A mage midwife had predicted my mother would have twins a year before she was pregnant. She predict anything else? Colin pondered how he could spend more time with her without it looking too obvious. Just that we would be mages. You'll forgive me if I say that I have a hard time picturing your brother as a mage. This caused her to giggle again, and Connell is, Connell is smitten. He never wanted to be a mage. Wanted to be a warrior, a soldier. Pa wouldn't hear it, especially after the midwife said he was going to be a mage. Connell thought about it a moment. Is he a mage because that is what he really is supposed to be, or because your father made him become one, and therefore the midwife prediction is true regardless of his desires? Corlys stared at him as they had plumbed the depths of a divine mystery. You were the first person ever to understand that. I thought, I thought that all along, but never wanted to say anything because it would just make my father angry. Besides, now it's too late for him to be anything other than a mage. I understand. I think we're far enough away from the city now, Boldar said, knowing with annoying grin at Connell, who glanced around realizing they had passed through the main gates and he hadn't even noticed. You can tell us about dragons now. Hold that thought, Lorcan announced, seeing a runner headed his way, young man moving at a good clip. 
Commander, the young man greeted him, catching his breath. Sorch has intercepted a large force that is falling back towards us. She asked for immediate help. I, I thought she was at least two days north of us, Connell said. We'll never reach her in time. We need to try, my lord. She's a resourceful commander, but she can't, can't hold out against Torian and what remains of Calavir's army. Connell's lips pursed. This is not how we intend to begin. We need Torian's attention in the east. Narrowing his attention to the messenger, he asked, how did you get this information? Message Hawk. My lord, Thorkin corrected. The young man's eyes popped wide. My lord, how long did it take for a hawk to get here? A couple of hours, uh, my lord. A couple of hours? He was about to say that it was impossible, but he recalculated that a hawk could average 30 miles an hour. That would put Sorcha around 60 miles away. With a forced march, they could make it there in two days. Your orders, my lord? Lorcan asked. Connell thought quickly. This could still work. If Gwen can move her forces by the time we connect with Sorsha, it might still work. Turning his head to look at Valdir, he said, what was the dwarf commander with us at the meeting? Eh, he's a prickly one. Because his feelings hurt with the drop of a hat. Near as I can see, he was waiting for the royal invitation from you. <sighs> we don't have time for games, Connell growled. Lorcan, get ready to move. We need to help Sorsha. You too, he said to the dwarves. Let's go have a heart to heart with story. Not forgetting Galadir, he said, would you mind finding out where our druid is? As you wish, Galadir replied with a respectful nod. What about me? Corla piped out. You go with, no, change that. You come with me. Connell increased his pace. The dwarves and Corla quick marching to keep up. As they made their way to the dwarven camp, Volder leaned into Corla. The commander's name is Story Broken Nose. You'll understand this when you see him. One thing you gotta watch out though, is not to slip up and call him Snorri. As you can imagine, it doesn't like being reminded of his nose. It can't be that bad, she replied. Oh, it was that bad when they stepped into Story's tent and he looked up from behind the small field table he was using as a desk. Story's nose looked like it had been hit with a smithy's hammer across the bridge for it was nearly flat, the nostrils like two eruptions on both sides. We missed you at our meeting, Commander. Connell said, doing his best to stare into the dwarf's eyes. I wasn't invited, he harumphed. You don't need an invitation, Connell emphatically said. You are an army commander. How am I supposed to plan and organize when the battle captain of half my force thinks he needs to be invited? When I asked King Rorkin for support, he promised me he would send his best soldiers with his best commander. So you see, I need input from Rorkin, Rorkin Orfell's best commander. A swage story cleared his throat. Yeah, <clears throat> well, all of us understanding, I'm sure. Good. We need to move out immediately. Sorcerer is under attack and needs our support. If you ride with me, I'd like to go over what we discussed in the meeting and you get and get your input. Flattered. Story stood up and barked out orders to get ready to move, then cast a look of authority at Torbeth and Voldar. What are you two lollygagging around here for? Go find your regiment. The two exchanged a word glance that neither knew to which regiment they belonged. Besides, they had no clue what it meant to be a dwarf soldier. They liked where they were, hanging out with Connell. With your permission, General, Connell intervened. I'd like to keep these two with me as liaison officers representing you. They know the operation would be beneficial to me as the campaign proceeds, acting as messengers between you and me. Story harumphed again and furrowed a thick brow at them. All right, my lord, if you can put up with these two, that works for me. Saves me the trouble of finding suitable liaison folks. Thank you. Well then, I'll leave you to get your army ready. I'll send one of the liaison officers to find you and let you know where I am. Once outside, Torbridge sidled up the Connell, sighing a big, thank you. That was very diplomatically played, my lord, Corla commented, impressed. You don't need personalities interfering with our battle plans. I meant what I said in there. I need them. As Connell led the way to where Lorcan's army was lining up, he turned his head to look at Corla. Can you contact your brother and tell him what's happening? What specifically, my lord? That we've been forced into attacking earlier than we had planned. She needs to get her forces in place and engage as quickly as possible. He turned his head to see where he was going. And my name is Connell. I know, my lord, she replied, her voice almost a coup. 
and I'm flattered with your familiarity, familiarity, for you are still a king's son, a prince, and I'm just a mage. Connell slid his eyes to the right to catch the glimpse of a beautiful woman strutting next to him. You are far more than just a mage. Are you playing hard to get? Is this, is, is there a man in your life? He was about to ask when she bent her head, staring at the ground as they walked. She abruptly stopped, causing the others to stop. She found him puzzlement, tilting her head to look up at Connell. I don't understand. He's not responding. The only reason for that is his mind is focused, concentrating on something else too much or so much that he's not listening. Connell's jaw tightened and resumed walking, shaking his head. What's the point of you being here other than distraction if, if you can't communicate with that idiot brother of yours? This is not good. If it doesn't work now, what makes you think it will work when I really need it? I I'm, I I'm sorry, my lord, Corlett fretted, taking three steps to his two to keep up. Forget it, Connor replied, though his irritation was evident. You can try again later. Yes, my lord, she replied, lowering her eyes. Connor was about to fuss at her to stop calling him my lord when a runner from Lorcan raced up. My lord, Commander Lorcan said Sorcia's forces are a day out. She was surrounding ground faster than she could retreat. Commander Lorcan says that it is imperative that you give the order to march. Tell him to do so, Connor replied, breaking into a run. Tell me force march until we get there. And it's heating up. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, guys. And uh, make sure you subscribe if you're not subscribed. And um, watch out for next week's video. See you guys.